Ladies and gentlemen, we have uh, Dr. Thomas Soule on the phone with us uh, from uh, Stanford, and he's at the uh, at the Hoover Institution at Stanford. He's the uh, Rose and uh, and Milton Friedman uh, uh, fellow. Uh, you've um, uh, put out an expanded version of your uh, very, very excellent book, uh, Intellectuals and Society. And we talked some time back about the uh, Intellectuals and Society. What was the expanded part? I added four new chapters, uh, on a, a whole section titled Intellectuals and Race. Mm-hmm. Uh, and my assistant uh, urged me to publish that as a separate book, which in retrospect uh, uh, wish I had done. But yet I, I wanted this book to really cover the major areas of uh, controversy, uh, intellectual and political. And so I put this in the book, and, mm-hmm. and, I, and, and I advanced various theses in these chapters that I've not advanced before and that I haven't seen anywhere else. Uh, for example, I have a, a long discussion of the whole question of disparities between groups. Well, groups oh have God, had disparities yeah. as long as there have been groups. That's right. And the disparities, they don't necessarily mean that there's any kind of injustice or discrimination. And the other thing that, that, that's, that's in, the, in the first of these chapters on uh, intellectuals and race is, is about the role of intellectuals in promoting racism. I mean, the intellectuals today are ready to cry racism at, at the drop of a hat. But if you go back 100 years ago, uh, 1912, for example, you will find that nobody was pushing uh, the idea that some races were capable only of being hewers of wood and drawers of water, like the intellectuals. Mm -hmm. I mean, Keynes helped found the uh, eugenics society at Cambridge University. Mm -hmm. And Woodrow Wilson. Oh, Woodrow Wilson. Oh, my gosh, yes. Mm -hmm. Uh, Woodrow Wilson was showing the uh, movie uh, Birth of a Nation, which glorifies the Ku Klux Klan, in the White House to mm-hmm. various leaders that he called in to view it with him. And, and these, and, and he, Woodrow Wilson and, and people around that time, they were called progressives, weren't they? This was one of the hallmarks of progressivism. People don't understand that. That the progressives were pushing the idea that not only were there inferior races, and they went beyond blacks and uh, Native Americans, they, went, they, they, they included the, the Jews, they included the Italians, uh, they included the peoples of Eastern and Southern Europe in general. And then it was they who pushed for uh, uh, laws outlawing intermarriage and restrictions on uh, immigration based upon uh, the race of the people coming in and so mm-hmm. on. So uh, it's ironic because, of course, by the last decades of the 20th century, the intellectuals were on the other side. Mm-hmm. But in both eras, they did not take any criticism seriously. They, they dismissed all attempts to say that, that there were other things to consider. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah. And so that dogmatism was there in both times, even though they were saying the opposite things in one period. But mm-hmm. there were lots of very pe- people who were respect- respectable. Any number of international scholarly organizations, these, these were not the village uh, idiots. These were not a bunch of ignorant rednecks. These were people with PhDs from the leading universities mm-hmm. in the country and who, taught, who were professors at the leading universities in the country. Uh, and something interesting that you said in, in, in your book, that the, the term progressives fell out of favor, and the people who were called progressives, who were calling themselves progressives, soon called themselves liberals. It's just like bankruptcy. <laughs> that is, when, when, you, when you build up a, a whole record as looking bad, uh, then you simply change your name and escape the, the record. Is. It was what, what I believe FDR was the first one to start calling himself liberal. Uh-huh. He'd been part of the progressives, part of the progressive uh, Woodrow Wilson administration. That's right. And and then then actually liberals uh, a little bit later on started uh, falling out of favor, and now they're back to progressives. The, for the same reason. That, uh, <laughs> now, now that liberals had disgraced themselves, they'd produced so many disastrous programs. Uh, they now started uh, calling themselves progressives, and they started demonizing anyone who, who, who called them liberals, saying we shouldn't have labels. <laughs> uh, well, la- labels are very wonderful. It's like, it's, it's, it's like brand names with commodities. Mm-hmm. You know, the, 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 those brand names force you to live with the consequences of what you've done in the mm-hmm. past. Yeah, and it turns out that uh, black Americans have suffered the most as, as a group for some of these half-baked ideas of the progressives. Oh, uh, absolutely. And I, I would include in that the, uh, the Great Society under Lyndon Johnson. When I think about it, that the black family survived through centuries of slavery, generations of Jim Crow, and then began to fall apart under the liberal welfare state. 
That's that's right, and and a lot of people don't know the statistics. You've pointed out, pointed them out, and I've pointed out in my in my book, of Race and Economics, that in the eighteen hundreds, eighteen eighties, that. Seventy-five percent of black kids live in two-parent families, where you, it's hard put to find thirty percent now. And in and in places like uh, this, uh, Herbert Gutman, I believe. Oh he, yes, sir. and he points out in Harlem in nineteen twenty-five, eighty-five percent of black kids lived in two-parent families. And he also said that it was rare, very rare, to see a black single woman, a teenager, a younger woman, raising a child by herself. That's right. At one period, most of the uh, black female-headed households were headed by widows who were older than teenagers. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I, I think one of the, one of the one of the rather tragic things for uh, for young people, whether they're black or white, but particularly for black youngsters, is the is the teaching of of uh, victimhood. And, oh God, yes. And and that uh, that they're victims and and they can't do anything about it, no matter how hard they try. And and you kind of think back. Well, heck, back in the 40s and the 30s, if young blacks were taught that same lesson back then, well, hell, the civil rights uh, movement would have never started. Uh, that, that, that's right. Uh, and, of course, there were far more restrictions on blacks then than today. But I, I never had this sense of, uh, of utility. I, I remember giving a talk at Marquette University, and some black young man I got up in the audience, he said, you know, I'm about to uh, uh, graduate from Marquette, but what, what, what hope is there for me? Oh and I said, you know, t- twice the hope for, that was for your parents and four times the hope that was for your grandparents. Yeah. But the, the, the grievances and navel-gazing and, and all kinds of stuff, unfortunately, all those blacks are the biggest uh, uh, victims of this in the United States. The very same thing goes on in England among whites. Yes. Uh, people who haven't read uh, Theodore Dalrymple's book, uh, Life at the Bottom, you can see, he says, you know, there are teenagers from this housing project near where he works as a doctor that come to see him, and he, he finds, you know, they can't multiply six times nine. <laughs> yeah, I, I wrote about this my, this week's column, uh, We Don't Want No Education. Oh, yes, yes. <laughs> And you realize that this is this is a race of people that produced Newton and Shakespeare and so forth, and now they're turning out a whole generation that can't do simple arithmetic, and have no conception of reading or even spelling. Uh-huh. And so, so it's not a racial thing; it's the underclass and what has been done by the education establishment and the welfare state. Uh, absolutely, and the two, and, and the two things go together. That is, in order to have the welfare state, you have to promote a welfare state ideology that will justify it in, in, in a democracy. And so, therefore, you get all these people thinking they can't do anything, and what's the point of learning because the, the system is against you anyhow? And it's a deadly uh, ideology. No, you're absolutely right.